Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to the very early morning uh, session of our uh, conference. Uh, this panel is called Freedoms and Access in the Digital Age. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our uh, scintillating panelists uh, who are right here. Um, so our first presenter is Jeffrey Rosen, who is both a law scholar and a widely published journalist. As a legal scholar, Jeffrey teaches constitutional law, criminal procedure, and the law of privacy at the George Washington University Law School. As a journalist, he is a legal affairs editor of the New Republic and a frequent contributor to the New York Times Magazine, the Atlantic Monthly, the New Yorker, and NPR. In journalism and in scholarship, Jeffrey's main interest has been legal, philosophical, and practical aspects of privacy in contemporary America. This interest is manifested in his numerous articles, commentaries, and in his books. Uh, his first book, The Unwanted Gaze, The Destruction of Privacy in America, focuses on erosion of privacy in the context, context of Clinton era scandals. Uh, his second book, his latest book, The Naked Crowd, Reclaiming Security and Freedom in an Anxious Age, is an analysis of privacy and in particular digital privacy in the post 9-11 world. Um, uh, at this point, uh, I could have quoted from professional reviews, of which there are plenty, uh, but in the spirit of cyber democracy, I went to Amazon.com <laughs> customer reviews, and I wanted to share you the first line of a review signed by Amazon.com customer Charlie Tango Foxtrot, which reads, if you value freedom, read this book. Um, so our second presenter, Esther Hargitay, is an assistant professor in communication studies and sociology and a faculty fellow in the Institute for Policy Research at Northwestern University. Her main research area is sociology of the internet, in particular in her numerous book chapters and articles published in such journals as Annual Review of Sociology and Information Technology in Society. She's been studying the concept of digital divide and reproduction of social inequalities in digital environment. Her latest work on this subject is a forthcoming book chapter towards a social framework for information seeking where she was her co-authors examines how one's social position influences one's information behavior. She's not only a scholar of the internet, she's also an active and very interesting practitioner. In addition to Esther.com, uh, there is also a very useful and informative Esther's lists uh, with hundreds of subscribers, and of course Esther's blog. Uh, the last entry on the Esther's blog is dated May 13th, which is yesterday, and the very last line of this entry reads, and I'm not sorry I'm at Dartmouth, I'm participating in an interesting conference. <laughs> I think we can all agree with this. <laughs> Our third presenter is David Phillips, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Radio, Television, and Film Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. His main research areas are digital privacy, social construction of online identity, representation and surveillance, um, development and deployment of technological systems, information policy, and media economics. His approach to these topics borders on disciplines of political economy and cultural studies. His latest works include From Privacy to Visibility, Context, Identity, and Power in Ubiquitous Computing Environments, that's forthcoming in social text, and Negotiating the Digital Closet, Online Pseudonymity and the Politics of Sexual Identity, in information, communication, and society. He was recently a Fulbright professor at the University of Tampa in Finland and is currently working, working on People and Place, a project investigating uh, well, geographic information systems. Uh, so let's welcome our panelists. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and to meet uh, Mark Williams and the members of this important institute. I've admired many of your work, and I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. My first book, as it happens, about privacy was greatly improved and transformed by a conversation at Dartmouth, uh, and I'm expecting, at least on my part, similar benefits from this uh, conversation. Mark asked me to talk about privacy and security in a post-9-11 surveillance society. And my thesis is simple, uh, namely that it is possible through law and technology to protect privacy and security at the same time. And I also come with an optimistic message, far more so than I would have imagined in the immediate wake of 9-11, namely that politics can usefully ensure 
the adoption of better rather than worse laws and technologies. And I want to give uh, some concrete examples of what I have in mind. Uh, let me begin, begin with a simple hypothetical about the choice between uh, different architectures of privacy and security. Uh, and the example I have in mind, I want to call the naked machine, because this is more or less what it is. This is one of the high-tech x-ray machines that's being tested at airports. Heathrow Airport in London is trying it as we speak. This is a three-dimensional millimeter imaging machine that bounces off the human body. It reveals not only metal, but plastics or ceramics, anything that's concealed under clothing. It's a great security device. The cost is uh, it shows us completely stark naked. Now, it turns out that given the choice between being naked at the airport and waiting for three minutes online, many people are pleased to go through the naked machine. They're lining up uh, for it because, as it happens, many people don't value privacy very heavily at the airport which reminds us that we should never generalize too broadly about these technologies. But the naked machine is a good example because uh, the people who designed it at the Pacific Northwest Laboratories came up with a simple programming shift. They took the pictures of the plastics or the ceramics or the concealed objects and projected them onto a mannequin, a sexless mannequin, and then took the pictures of the naked body and scrambled it into a nondescript blob. So this alternative, this magnificent alternative, the blob machine as opposed to the naked machine, First of all, it's an act of mercy for most of us, obviously, at the airport. And uh, it also is an example of a silver bullet technology. It pr protects just as much security while also protecting privacy. So my thought is that most of the laws and technologies since 9-11 uh, in and out of cyberspace that have been discussed can, in theory, be designed in ways that look more like the blob machine than the naked machine. And it's just a question of politics. Uh, and law and architecture that will determine the adoption of the good rather than the bad technologies. So now I want to give three examples of the blob machine, naked machine-like choice that I uh, have in mind. Uh, this is the example of surveillance cameras in Britain and America. Uh, second, data mining uh, at airports for security purposes and in the consumer sphere. And finally, uh, the Patriot Act and many of the post-9-11 uh, security laws that have been passed. Uh, each of these are cases where badly designed naked machine-like technologies were initially proposed, but because of political resistance, uh, more blob machine versions emerged. Let's begin with surveillance cameras. This is the technology that got me interested in this topic uh, after 9-11 in the first place. I was sent to England by uh, a magazine to examine a question that became far more urgent uh, when I returned, which was uh, uh, the week uh, before 9-11 than it was when the article was, was conceived, namely, how is it possible that Britain, the cradle of um, uh, liberty, wired itself up with so many surveillance cameras in the 1990s that it resembles the set of the Truman Show? This is a story that many of you know well. Uh, the story is familiar. It was fear of terrorism, in particular IRA bombings that led to the proliferation of these cameras, such a broad proliferation that uh, the country is estimated to have 4.5 million cameras. Uh, the average Briton is said to be photographed 300 times a day. The place is lousy with cameras. If you haven't been back yesterday, it's stunning how pervasive they are. So Britain is a good cautionary tale because it's uh, an example of the imperviousness to empirical argument that uh, many people experience when faced with uh, diffuse fears and abstract arguments about privacy. So confronted with the British government's own study suggesting there was no connection between the spread of the cameras and the decline of violent crime or terrorism, the public was indifferent. They couldn't get enough of them. Tony Blair ran for re-election on the slogan, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. And uh, people were uninterested in the fact that this was essentially a feel-good uh, technology that had few tangible benefits. Uh, quickly, they began to be used for secondary purposes. They were installed in the city of London, the historic core of the city, to protect against terrorism. Uh, they caught no terrorists. They're now used to charge a car tax, a $7 car tax for every car that comes into the city and to log the license plates of cars that don't leave at the same time. There's also a panoptic-like uh, use to these technologies. In the borough of Newham, which is the one borough that's using face recognition technology, it was said that the faces of terrorists would be put in the database and would alert whenever any suspicious person entered the city. But in fact, there are no terrorists in the database. Uh, they don't know who the terrorists are. Terrorism is the crime that has no face. Instead, the people in the database are either kids who have acted up in shopping malls or more uh, to the point, uh, no faces at all. They're dummy cameras often that, are, uh, uh, that have no uh, film but are meant to make people feel that they're being watched even when they're not. This is the Benthamite uh, insight which is being played out in uh, England in a tangible way. 
So uh, England is my cautionary tale because it's an example of a democracy without checks and balances that faced with tangible fears uh, would uh, voluntarily, eagerly, enthusiastically embrace a surveillance society. There's also the danger in an age of interactivity and digital storage of ubiquitous surveillance. You could imagine uh, forward clicking on a picture of me in the London Underground, uh, back clicking on me to see where I'd uh, come from in the morning, forward clicking on me to see where I uh, ended up at work, and basically to have uh, total surveillance of anyone in the system at any point in time. This feeds on Mark's uh, very interesting paper, which we discussed yesterday, and which I'm looking forward to uh, reading about the ties between uh, uh, both uh, TiVo-like uh, insights and the effort to extend uh, ubiquitous surveillance in the uh, public and private sphere. So I would have imagined that in America, the same path would be taken as Britain after 9-11. And in the immediate wake of 9-11, it seemed that th that was what was going to happen. The uh, Bush administration and the Washington Metropolitan Police proposed a British-style surveillance system that would unite cameras on the National Mall with cameras in schools and in uh, uh, other public places and would make possible the kind of ubiquitous surveillance that London is moving toward. But in America, something very interesting happened that I wouldn't have anticipated. There was a political reaction and an unusual coalition of civil libertarian liberals and libertarian conservatives objected fiercely to the cameras. And their most uh, energetic opponents turned out to be not only the ACLU, but also Dick Armey, the former House Majority Leader, and Bob Barr, the scourge of President Clinton, who's now a privacy advocate of the first rank. And because of these objections, the, uh, and a series of congressional hearings, the Washington City Council embraced a series of use regulations on the use of cameras. So, uh, although they were originally proposed to be turned on all the time, now they can only be turned on in response to a specific threat. The tapes can't be kept for more than a period of time, and there are prohibitions on the sharing of tapes among uh, administrative agencies. Whether this compromise will hold remains to be seen, but this was a remarkable and heartening victory for privacy, and it came about because of this uh, hearty but uh, bipartisan coalition. So that's my first uh, story, and it's a story about how political culture, America is far more libertarian than Britain, suspicious of government, and also uh, the separation of powers made possible uh, over, uh, congressional oversight of the executive in a way that wasn't possible in Britain led to, at least in the short term, a good result. So my second example is data mining, and this is the most complicated uh, example, and it's the greatest uh, challenge, uh, 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 theoretically and practically, but it too is a moderately optimistic tale that I couldn't possibly have anticipated. So in the immediate wake of 9-11, it was proposed to create an extremely ambitious data mining system uh, uh, for use at airports and other security environments. In its most naked machine-like version, the uh, system was called total information awareness. You remember this from uh, John Poindexter's ill-conceived experimental institute that was trying to explore ways of using data mining technologies that had been developed in the consumer sphere for national security. And the Poindexter system proposed to create a grand centralized database that would unite public information like arrest records and immigration records with private records now maintained by enormous data warehouses like uh, ChoicePoint and uh, Axiom and LexisNexis, which are reinventing themselves from uh, information uh, brokers into uh, uh, national security partners. And uh, based on this grand centralized database, uh, which would uh, be uh, personally identifiable to each individual traveler by having data united with a biometric, like a thumbprint, for example, uh, every time that uh, someone checked in at the airport, uh, neural network technology would attempt to uh, predict, based on people's consumer habits and public records, whether or not they resemble one of the 9-11 terrorists. So, for example, if you took uh, flying lessons in Florida and bought a one-way ticket, you might be tagged as a red alert and taken into a back room and bludgeoned or something like that. And if you were uh, blameless, you'd be yellow or green. Now, uh, what was wrong with this system? Well, it wouldn't have worked, and it posed grave threats to privacy, but aside from that, Mrs. Lincoln, it was a wonderful system. The empirical objection, many of you will understand better than I do. I'm not good on uh, statistics, but as it's been explained to me, when you're looking for very small uh, data samples among a tremendously large uh, pool, you're going to get lots of false positives and false negatives. So imagine a system that is 99% accurate, has a 1% failure rate, 300 million travelers being scanned at the airport, 1% of 3 million is 3 million uh, people wrongly identified, but if the thing is 50% accurate, 150 million, but 
if the next attack looks nothing, nothing like the last one, and the whole idea of trying to predict future attacks based on past behavior is as false as it must surely be, a 1% accuracy rate, basically everyone who stopped is wrongly identified and all the real terrorists get through, you'd have to be stopping a dirty bomb with each search to justify such an ineffective system. Uh, that's the empirical objection. Then there's the privacy objection, uh, which is uh, grave and serious, uh, although harder to define than you might imagine. And I know you were talking about some of this yesterday. Uh, the challenge to be specific about what exactly the harms of data mining are is one that uh, we, or at least, at least I, should uh, take seriously. I found that the most uh, tangible harm, the, the one that's easiest to describe, is the Nixon effect. This is uh, Nixon didn't like the Vietnam protesters who criticized him, so he went after their tax returns and threatened them with prosecution. You could imagine, in theory, when data is uh, aggregated and personally identifiable, you, you know this uh, history better than uh, we do, it would be possible to uh, go after critics of the government, look at their tax returns, uh, engage in uh, uh, discriminatory surveillance, and threaten them with vindictive prosecution. So that's an old story. It was real. Uh, most of American privacy law in the 70s was passed in response to the abuses of uh, uh, Nixon, and uh, it's one that uh, should be taken seriously. There are also threats to identity in a digital world where data mining technologies developed in the consumer sphere to classify customers based on their trustworthiness uh, are implemented in the national security sphere. And we can talk uh, more about this perhaps in our conversation. If it's interesting or not, I won't uh, talk about it a lot, except to say that uh, the idea of classifying people based on their trustworthiness is not only a privacy violation, it's an equality violation. And perhaps it's antithetical to the democratic ideal that citizens have to demonstrate their trustworthiness to the government and are put in different categories uh, ba and, uh, based on their uh, behavior in the past. This is an offense against the ideal of uh, being able to reinvent uh, yourself. Uh, it's a form of classification and exclusion, and it's an equality violation. And David Lyon, who I know has talked to your institute before, has written uh, persuasively on this point. So uh, there are a cluster of uh, threats to identity that we could uh, talk about uh, in terms of privacy or equality or dignity, but these are all real when data is aggregated in person identifiable ways. The reason that the data mining story is uh, surprisingly to me, I never would have imagined this, a moderately optimistic one too, is because this system also evolved in response to political objections. There was an intermediate version of the system uh, that was called the Computer Assisted Passenger Profiling System. This was a uh, version of the thing that is going to be tried at airports relatively soon, although it keeps getting delayed because of further objections. So in the intermediate design of total information awareness, there were two important changes. First, uh, the government abandoned the idea of engaging in predictive data mining and trying to uh, uh, put people in different categories based on their future dangerousness, and instead just decided to authenticate that they are who they say they are. So once it confirmed that I am Jeff, I have a stable identity, uh, I was allowed to go through without asking whether I looked like Muhammad Atta. So that's an important thing. It, it's, an, it's a response to the uh, foolishness of trying to predict terrorist behavior in the future based on uh, behavior in the past. There was also a privacy improvement. The fear of the Nixon effect was that data would be promiscuously shared and that people could be threatened with prosecution for lower level crimes that had nothing to do with terrorism. So the government responded by imposing a use limitation. It said the data could only be shared between the transportation people and law enforcement if there was evidence of an outstanding warrant for a violent felony or crime. If evidence of lower level crimes was discovered, the data could not be shared. This is a tremendous insight. I think it's the one that the Europeans have grasped uh, far earlier than we do. In particular, the Germans, who have the most uh, daunting history with the excesses of the police state, uh, have in their privacy law a similar use limitation. In Germany, the intelligence services have broad discretion to surveil without suspicion private data, but they can't share this intelligence with law enforcement unless they find evidence of terrorism or serious crimes. Uh, if they find evidence of low-level uh, indiscretions, uh, such as evidence relevant to an adultery uh, or divorce prosecution, this evidence has been excluded from German courts on the theory that although adultery is very, very bad, no one should engage in it, it is not serious enough to justify the Nixon effect like, or uh, the German versions of that, which are even more daunting, uh, dangers of uh, prosecuting people for lower level crimes in a vindictive or discriminatory way. 
Now, incidentally, I was distressed to learn recently from a German privacy commissioner that this use limitation is now under political siege in a post 9-11 Germany, and it may be abandoned. So the effort to maintain use limitations in an age of fear is difficult. But in America, in this intermediate version of the data mining system I've described, it was imposed. But even that wasn't enough for the privacy advocates. And the same coalition of civil libertarian liberals and libertarian conservatives continued to object so that the most recent version of the airport profiling scheme, which has yet another name, uh, d doesn't allow for any information sharing at all. Even if you find evidence of an outstanding warrant for a violent crime or felony, the information can't be shared. The system is only designed to authenticate that people are who they say they are and nothing else. Now, this is remarkable. I could never have imagined that uh, we would have moved from a total information awareness-like naked machine model to a blob machine uh, airport-like model in the period of two years. It was done quietly. It was under the radar screen, uh, mostly by negotiation uh, among administrative agencies. Whether the compromise will hold, I have no idea. There'll be tremendous pressure to expand the system and to use it for secondary purposes, of course. But at least in the short term, an important, meaningful, dramatic victory for privacy that we should take seriously and reminds us of the effectiveness of politics. And then my third and final example is the Patriot Act, and uh, in particular Section 215, which is the most uh, controversial provision, which is up for renewal this year, and therefore there are hearings being held on it right now. Section 215 is the one that's gotten the librarians of America all upset. And I beg you, ladies and gentlemen, if you do anything in your careers, make sure that you don't upset America's librarians because they're very fierce and eloquent uh, supporters of civil liberties and they create a lot of trouble. Mrs. Bush is a librarian and she didn't like the protests of her former colleagues and was said to have uh, registered her disapproval. What is Section 215 and why is it so controversial? agent of a foreign power, a suspected spy or terrorist. If you had probable cause to believe that someone was a suspected spy or terrorist uh, and was an agent of a foreign power, using this power, including library records, which is why the librarians are upset. But far more importantly, the scope of people who are susceptible to this broad search has been dramatically expanded. You used to have to certify that the person was an agent of a foreign power. Now the government need merely certify that the information is relevant to a legitimate terrorism investigation. This is essentially removing uh, any particularity requirement because there's not meaningful oversight of the government certification. So merely by saying that the information is relevant, uh, essentially the government has carte blanche to search from third party databases in secret without notice, whatever it likes. Now the question of whether 215 in fact has been abused is hotly contested. The government certified that it's rarely if ever been uh, used, which has led critics to counter then why is it uh, necessary. But uh, in theory, it's aroused an awful lot of opposition. Now, is there a possibility for a meaningful amendment of Section 215? This is the political debate that's going on now. On this point, I'm less optimistic, but I was uh, too pessimistic before, as my previous example shows, so we'll see. But poll numbers here seem to me relevant. It seems odd to be citing poll numbers in a debate about uh, fundamental uh, statutory and constitutional questions, but these are poll numbers that were cited to me by none other than John Ashcroft, the former Attorney General, who I had the pleasure of interviewing uh, not long ago for a, a magazine piece. And I should say, first of all, to my surprise, Ashcroft was not the ogre that I'd been uh, told to expect. 
he's a, a very jockish guy. He likes to talk about uh, you know baseball and that sort of thing. And I'm one of the only guys in America who can't do sort of basic sports talk. So he was asking, you know, hey, how about the Mets? And I broke into a cold sweat, you know, and I thought I was going to be taken into a back room. But he was very friendly and very jolly. But uh, we talked for a bit, and I and then he said, what's this about the Patriot Act? You know, uh, the criticism been, criticisms have been overstated. Uh, and he said, you know, most Americans like the Patriot Act. A recent poll, he said, suggests that 50% of Americans think the Patriot Act strikes the right balance between privacy and security. 20% think it doesn't go far enough. And only 20% think it goes too far. That This is the coalition of civil libertarian liberals and libertarian conservatives who have uh, done so much good work on surveillance cameras and data mining. Uh, so said Ashcroft, you know, 70% of the country is with us. I think these criticisms are overstated. It's just a small and vocal minority, as he calls his libertarian and civil libertarian critics, who are objecting. Now, as a legal matter, it's odd to hear the Attorney General citing poll numbers. Incidentally, it convinced me that far from being primarily a religious zealot, he's much more of a politician. He's a former senator who surrounds himself with uh, political aides and views these questions in essentially political terms. But it is nevertheless a meaningful datum uh, that there is not going to be a tremendous clamoring for uh, a repeal of a provision that most of the country broadly accepts, even though it couldn't describe uh, in, in detail if asked about it. Uh, nevertheless, these hearings are going on. There are proposals at the very least to minimize the secrecy of the searches and to allow companies whose third party data has been seized to notify uh, their own lawyers who could at least give individuals a chance to quash these uh, searches before they occurred. My own preference for a repeal of, or amendment of Section 215 would use the German control use model that proved so successful in amending the data mining systems. Uh, maybe it's a bit complicated to describe, but I think there are two aspects to uh, the challenge. First, you want to allow the government to prosecute people for lower level crimes when uh, they are pretty sure that someone is dangerous but can't quite prove it. So this is a version of the Al Capone effect. Al Capone was the mobster who people, they were suspected of being a mobster, they couldn't uh, prove it, so he was prosecuted for tax invasion instead. And the core of the government's prevention strategy after 9-11 has been to prosecute people for lower level crimes before they have the chance to do something worse. So a Hezbollah cell in North Carolina, for example, was prosecuted for cigarette smuggling rather than terrorism because they didn't want to wait until terrorist activities occurred. You'd want to allow that kind of Al Capone-like prosecution, but only in cases where you had at least some suspicion that an individual was dangerous. So that's why the pre-Patriot Act compromise, which allowed for these secret searches when someone was certified in advance as a suspected spy or terrorist, is a good model. So uh, Section 215 could be uh, amended by restoring the requirement that someone is suspected in advance of being a suspected spy or terrorist, then uh, they could be prosecuted for lower level crimes. For everyone else, if there's no reason to believe that someone is uh, dangerous in advance, data cannot be shared uh, unless it relates to a serious crime rather than a low level crime. So a control use model for suspicionless data searches, a form of uh, uh, a, a prosecution for lower level crimes, but only for individuals who are identified in advance as suspicious. That for what it's worth is my thought about uh, a plausible patriot reform, the fact that it's complicated to explain, it takes more than 15 uh, seconds, and also many of you may disagree with it as well, suggests that it may not be adopted. Lots of people feel there's nothing wrong with prosecuting anyone for lower level crimes uh, if they're guilty. And this is what Ashcroft said when I talked to him about Section 215. He said, what's the problem with Section 215? Well, I said, you could imagine critics of the government, uh, people who criticize you, uh, having their data searched, and then being prosecuted for credit card fraud. And his response was, what's so great about credit card fraud that you want to protect it? You know, lots of people spend their lives saving their money. We have to prosecute crime wherever it occurs. That was a politician's response, not a zealot's response, but I think many Americans share it, which is why the idea of voluntary impositions of these use limitations uh, may not be politically saleable. But we'll see. So there, there are my three examples. I have two optimistic ones, one that uh, is still open and uh, uh, this just leads me to close by reiterating the tremendous importance of politics uh, for reasons that uh, I won't talk about uh, uh, now because I'm going to uh, close. The courts are not a good uh, protection for the complicated balance between privacy and security that we've been discussing. 
uh, there's a strong property-based tradition in American privacy law, but the, di the injuries of data mining and of surveillance cameras, which have more to do with dignity and exclusion than they do with property, are not ones that American constitutional law is well equipped to uh, protect. Similarly, obviously, the executive branch is not going to save us in these debates. Uh, responding to the public, it tends to demand as much power as possible. But Congress can play a meaningful role. It seems odd to praise Congress during this polarized time when the Senate seems about to blow itself up by eliminating the filibuster rule. But nevertheless, this hardy coalition of civil libertarian liberals and libertarian conservatives, although it does not represent a majority constituency in the country as a whole, does have meaningful influence in Congress, uh, and it's proved it uh, in these uh, two debates, and I hope it'll prove it in the third one. So uh, with that, I leave you. Uh, it is possible to strike a good balance between privacy and security. All we need is the political will. Thank you so much. As I set up, I should give you a little bit of a background on that quote on my blog. <laughs> um, it was, it, it turns out Princeton women's lacrosse is playing Northwestern women's lacrosse tomorrow. And since I went to Princeton, now I teach at Northwestern, it would have been an interesting game for me to see, especially since it's being held right outside my office. But I'll be here. so. I commented on the blog that I, unfortunately I couldn't attend, but then I said, I'm not sorry that I can't attend because I'm at a great conference. So that should, that should give you the context. And in fact, I'm very happy to be here and I'm honored that you guys invited me. I've really enjoyed the discussions so far and look forward to, to the discussions we'll have today. So let's see if I can get this on the screen. Okay, good to have it twice. Um, okay, so my work is on digital inequality. I'm a sociologist by training, and I'm interested in how information technologies might either help reduce social inequality or might actually contribute to increase social inequality. So that's my background. Mark asked me to talk a little bit about international uh, digital inequality issues. It's something I used to work on. I don't work on so much anymore. I'll have a few figures just to give some larger context and then um, I'll continue by talking about digital inequality in the United States and I'll wrap up with a description of uh, some projects that I've been working on, specifically looking at skill. And I'll arrive at that throughout the talk as to how, why I study skill in particular. Okay, so here we have a trend of Basically, um, internet diffusion in the last 10 years, now you'll notice that some very important information is actually missing from this uh, figure, and that's actual numbers. And the reason <laughs> for that is that, um, so I'm very much an empiricist, and anyone who's, who, who knows my work or talked to me yesterday knows that. But I'm also very careful with numbers, and as I tried to look up figures for international connectivity, I got in incredibly contradictory numbers. I found very contradictory figures, so I didn't feel comfortable putting any of them up here for you. But the point is that there's been a trend of a lot, you know, a lot of increase in internet connectivity um, globally and anywhere from, say, if we had about 20 million people in 95, predictions now range for 2005 anywhere between about 250 million to as much as 900 million. So as you can see, those this huge discrepancy between the numbers, but minimum tenfold increase or much larger. But to put this in context, let's not forget the number of people in the world and taking the most optimistic figure. So even if we, if we consider that there are 900 million people using the internet today, that still leaves 83, no, 87% who are not connected at all. So that's just something to keep in mind as we talk about the internet and a wired world, et cetera, that we're really talking about a very specific part of the world. Put in other terms, 60% of countries have um, only a thousand, less, than ten, less than 1,000 users per 10,000 inhabitants, and 20% of countries, so one in five, have uh, less than 1% connectivity. So again, internet use is far from global, and I think that's important to remember. Moreover, if you, if you uh, 
look in detail as to what predicts connectivity, even if you study just the rich democratic countries, which I've done in the past, um, even within that subgroup of rich countries, one of the main predictors of who has larger level connectivity is wealth. So even among the rich, the richer do better on that, on that figure. So this is just, again, thinking about, you know, there was a lot of rhetoric about the potential leapfrogging effects, et cetera, but the fact is you have to be rich to have the internet in the first place. So that limits the potential to some extent. So now I wanna talk a little bit about the digital divide, which I put in quotes on purpose, um, in the United States. And I'll explain in a bit why I put that in quotes. Um, it got a lot of attention first in 1995 when the National Telecommunication and Information Administration came out with its first report called Falling Through the Net. And this was the, the this report included data from survey run by the census um, on computer and internet use, mostly computer use in that year and some modem use, and basically f found that certain segments of the population were falling behind significantly. In the next five years followed four more reports with the same title. Again, documenting differences between different segments of the population with the concern that certain segments were falling behind. Ta-da, come 2002, and we see a change in the title of the reports to a nation online. Now the question is, does that mean that suddenly the United States was all wired? Well, it could mean that, or it could just mean that there was actually a change in the administration and a change in the attitude towards how we consider what it means to be wired. And so um, there was a change in the administration. The FCC got a new chair, now former chair Michael Powell. And this is a quote that you might have heard before. But basically, his attitude was that having internet connection is more of a luxury item. It's not really a concern for public policy per se. Okay, but so there was this rhetorical shift in terms of how th what the reports uh, looked like, and this is also mirrored in the media. I did a search for uh, mentions of the digital divide in top U.S. dailies for this period, and you can see that there was a huge spike between 99 and 01, and then starting in 02, much less concern again, and the report comes out, it's called A Nation Online. The press isn't covering it anymore as a concern about the digital divide. But so does that mean that we really don't have any concerns anymore? Does this mean that Americans are pretty much wired at this point? So if this was true, then this is kind of a, a multiple choice little quiz for you. But so, so what percent of Americans are internet users today? Um, does anybody want to? Guess. Okay, well, you guys are kind of probably in the know about this topic. Um, but if we were to guess from partly the name of the reports and also the, you know, the decrease in the mention of digital divide in the media, you might think, oh, 90, 75%, but no, in fact, 60% of Americans are, are internet users today. Um, now, if we look at trends, it, it it looks good, right? It's been going up, um, although you can see that there's been a bit of a drop in terms of the rate of increase between 01 and 03. These data stop at 03. I, I usually, um, I prefer to use data from the U.S. Census because they, these data are based on over 100,000 respondents. It's really high quality data. But the last time they collected data on this was in 03, so that's what we have. But so there is a, a bit of a drop in increase, and in fact, um, Research does show that although some new people are still going online, there are also the so-called dropouts, so there isn't actually that much of an increase anymore. Now, again, if you, we look at it, it's an increase, it looks optimistic, but if we look at these figures in a different way, we have 60% um, users, that still leaves 40% of Americans as non-users, and that's, that's still a very big chunk of the population, so something that I think is worth remembering when we get all optimistic. Um, as some of the presenters were, or one particular presenter was yesterday, about the potential of the internet and that some segments are being left behind. Okay, so I wanted to uh, show you a couple of figures broken down by segments of the population. So for example, there was a lot of talk about how women were much less wired than men. I mean, it was never really that much less per se, although there were definitely differences now by 03, 
Um, you're actually more likely to be an internet user if you're a woman than if you're a man. But I, I would like you to remember this figure. I'm going to come back to it a little bit later. By education, there are some tremendous differences. Um, if you have just a high school degree, which is actually a very large chunk of the US population, I don't know if people realize, um, then you're less than 50% likely to be a user, whereas if you have a college degree or more, you're very likely to be an internet user. And then finally, I put this slide in because of the video we saw yesterday um, regarding questions of race and ethnicity. And um, I think this slide is interesting because it, it gives the opportunity for such different interpretations of the data. So you can basically help have data tell whatever story you'd like to spin. So the way we've heard, so if you want to write a, the report called A Nation Online, the way you spin the trend here is to say that, well, whereas in 94, only 5.5% of Hispanics were um, online, there was a sevenfold increase up to 36% in 03, whereas the increase wasn't quite as large among non-Hispanics. But of course, uh, if you want to take the more skeptical view, you clearly see that the gap is actually increasing. So there are very different ways of interpreting the data. OK, so I said that I talk about the digital divide, and I, I like to put it in quotes. And I, I don't, I prefer not to use it, actually, but because that's how most people think about the topic, I, I feel like I have to use it for people to know I'm addressing the topics they're thinking about. It's a binary, dichotomous classification of the have and have nots, and I consider it too simplistic. So the term I prefer to use is digital inequality, which includes a much more nuanced approach to differences um, among people with respect to their digital technology uses. So it, it understands that there's going to be more of a spectrum rather than a zero, one, or yes, no, or black, white divide. OK, so digital inequality partly means that different types of access will have different um, possibilities for users. And one of these concerns the quality of access. I think those of us who work in academia or, or in journalism or certain fields are so used to broadband and high-speed connections that I think it's really hard for us to remember what it was like to use dial-up connections. I mean, how many of you ever still go online using dial-up? So those of you who do probably realize how different it is. And it's really hard to, I mean, I think it's hard to imagine that if that's all you had, is there anyone here who only uses dial-up? OK, let's, then maybe you don't know the difference, but I think there's, <laughs> there's, there's a huge difference. And um, OK, well, you see this, but I'm taking, so I'm not even going to ask. Anyway, only 23% of, uh, of Americans age three and up live in households with with high-speed internet access. So again, that's just over one in five. It's a very small portion of Americans. To be fair, there are people who have high-speed access at, at work or other locations. But um, I'll get in, a little bit later, I'll, I'll get into why that's, that's not the same as having high-speed access at home. In terms of who has high-speed access, again, vast differences depending on your uh, socioeconomic status. So if you have higher income, much more likely, which is not surprising. I mean, high-speed access is actually quite expensive. I mean, I find it to be quite expensive. So I'm not surprised people, lots of people can't afford it. Um, but I wanted to, as I said, remember what the male-female um, connectivity levels look like. And this is interesting because what we have here is that although men are a little bit less likely to be online, they're more likely to have high-speed connection. And so again, these refined measures of connectivity are important because it shows that you know there might be women are might might be more likely to be online but men who are online are going to be more likely to have the more functional high speed access so when talking about digital inequality these are some of the variables that i think are important to consider so i talked about technical specification so difference in connection speed then there is what i call autonomy of use and that i define as the ability to access the medium, to have the freedom to access the medium when and where one wants to. So there are lots of surveys where they simply ask you, well, do you have access to the internet or do you use the internet somewhere? And that might be, that would include people who use it at a library. Now, 
it's, it's great that people have access at a library, but libraries can be located really far, have only certain hours, you might be in a line, that you know, you have much less privacy in terms of what you're doing um, using the medium. So it's, it's, a qual it's qualitatively different type of access than having it at home 24 hours a day. So that's just something I think is important to consider when we, we think about differences in people's internet use. Then there is um, social support networks, uh, which I think are important and I look at in my studies. And I hypothesize these two matter in two ways. One is the more informal way that if there are people in your social support networks who are also users, then just in your conversations, things might come up that, you know, suggestions on how to use things, great sites, good services, and that improves your ability to make the most of the medium, whereas if you don't know anybody who uses the medium, it's much harder to learn about um, helpful services or sites. And the other way social support networks might matter is that if there are people in your immediate surroundings who are also users, then you're more likely to be able to find support if you run into a problem. So if you run into a very specific problem, there's someone you can turn to ask for help, and that, that would make a difference. Experience is, is a, a factor that more and more studies are actually starting to look at. And here, again, two types. One is how many years have you been a user? That might matter. And also how much time do you spend online? Because again, there, there might well be a qualitative difference between those people who go online for an hour a week, which there's still lots of people who only do that, versus those of us who are online all the time. Much more um, possibilities for exploring what the medium might have to offer. And then something that I've focused on much is, in my work is skill, and so the difference in people's ability to make what they to do whatever they might want with the medium, and um, I I'm going to talk about my specific project. I I'll try to in, include a few anecdotal anecdotal um, little anecdotal bits from from the study about. Um, how much skill can really matter in terms of what people even realize you can do online. or just, So I consider that part of skill, realizing what you can even do with your access. Because um, sometimes there's this idea that, well, some people just don't want to be online or, or you know, they don't see the point. But I consider that part of skill to realize that there are certain things you can actually do online. Um, and then finally, types of uses. Do you go online to do just one thing, so you only use it to check your sports scores, or are you using it to enhance what I call, you know, capital enhancing activities, so things from which, again, you can benefit directly, either in terms of improving your human capital or financial capital. Okay, so why was the internet supposed to help, um, help uh, and basically um, help decrease uh, social inequality? Well, the, Assumptions were that with billions of documents online, everyone will be able to find whatever is of need. Um, and this is what I call available information, what's theoretically out there. If you know the address, you can get to it. But I, I distinguish between available information and accessible information, which I call information that's realistically within the reach of users. And that's partly has to do with um, whether um, you have the skill to find it, but also is content organized in a way that makes certain, um, that makes it harder for content actually to find the user. So it's kind of the reverse. Um, it's somewhat, it's somewhat related to the, one of my comments yesterday after the panel that um, there is not necessarily an equality towards audiences and gaining audiences. And so that's that side of the question. So, I ran a study to see how people actually look for information online, and I collected some survey data. We're going to be very brief about the methods, and you're definitely welcome to ask me more details later. But basically, brought in a, a hundred people who were randomly selected from from a county in New Jersey, and um, so th these are adults, very um, diverse, you know, all sorts of occupations, educational backgrounds, income. Uh, backgrounds and so I asked them to fill out surveys and then uh, watch them look for various types of information and then these are some of the technical specifications so they could choose whatever platform they were used to program they were used to I did not set a home page so it was very much really just from a clear slate watching how they find information 
Um, and I included AOL because it's such a different environment in terms of browsing environment. I wanted to see if it had any independent effects. And actually, one third of the users did were AOL users, so it was important to have that as an option. And so I created an audio video recording of what they did and then analyzed those data. And I'll, I'll show you just one of these, just so you see what the data looked like. So this, this is um, one of the users looking for used car in the area, Ford Escort. And this is probably, I'm showing you this just to show that even if you use Google, you might not get to what you're looking for. Because um, even for Google, you have to have certain skills in using search engines. Um, but anyway, it was very interesting coding this data because it feels like you're sitting in the person's head. So from these data, I, um, I could measure whether people were able to complete a task, how long they took, and then also coded all actions. So basically, the little video snippet you just saw would look like this in a spreadsheet, so that allows for aggregation of data afterwards. Um, so it's a lot of data. Um, Okay, so a few findings. People were given unlimited amounts of time to work on the, on the tasks, and in fact, if anything, these findings are somewhat conservative with respect to their abilities because I actually encouraged them to look even if they said they couldn't do something because I was very interested in the, the particular paths they would take to information. So in a regular setting, they might have given up quicker than I let them, um, but from this, situation and having sat with, with this many people, it was really fascinating to see how many times people would say, oh, well, that you can't find that online, which especially because you might think, well, it's an artificial setting, but even then they didn't, and I told them there were no trick questions, yet they would still think sometimes that I was asking for things that you cannot find online, uh, when in fact you could, and I mean, there were lots of possibilities for all the questions and there was no one right answer. So that just, again, that was an interesting indicator of how people have very different understandings of what things you can do online. Um, so what we have here is just a very basic level of difference in terms of people's abilities because what we see is conveniently numbers equal percentages, but what we see is that over a quarter of the people failed on at least a quarter of the tasks. Oh, I'm analyzing eight tasks here. So if people failed on two or more, that would be over a quarter of the two, quarter or over a quarter of the tasks. So there's some difference there. And then some of you asked that I leave some of the statistics, so I left one regression. Um, <laughs> but so basically, um, so I, here I have data on all the, the various factors that I mentioned that I think are important to digital inequality. I operationalized those in various ways and included data on those in the model. And then what we find is people who are older are less likely to be able to complete tasks. Those who have more years of education do better. And then also that um, how much time you spend on the, week, on the web per week matters, as does how many years you've been a user. But actually, the stronger predictor is how much time you spend online. So again, it's important to distinguish um, in terms of people's experiences online. OK, a little bit more information. These are specifics of the tasks that I analyzed here. And again, mo for the most part, most people can find information if given unlimited amounts of time. But it was really interesting to see that there was this one question which specifically was, find a website that compares different presidential candidates' views on abortion. So find one website that does that. And this was for the relevant for the 2000 election. So basically, a comparison of Bush and Gore's views on abortion. And only 57% of the people could do that. So 43% failed on this task, and again, worth a pause, you know, what are the internet's potential for political participation and information if people can't even find this kind of information that again existed on numerous websites. So I did uh, detailed analyses, statistical analyses, and I won't bore you with the figures, although if anyone's interested, I have them. But basically I included a dummy variable for people who used what I called an advanced um, search query for this question. So typed in a, a search term that included information both about abortion and political candidates or the names of the presidential candidates. And so those who, who searched that way got a, a, a dummy. And, and that came out significant. It turns out that's what predicted whether you could solve this task or not. But people tend to say, oh, just send people to Google. And so I specifically checked, did it matter if someone was using Google or not? And it turns out that did not matter. So what mattered was, can you 
do you know to use multiple terms to specify what you're searching for? If you do, it doesn't really matter if you're using Yahoo or MSN or Google. Okay, so uh, now looking at the organization of content and how that might influence um, what content is most easily accessible to users. One of the questions asked people to look for local cultural events. And here I, I left it up to the respondent to look for movie listings or orchestra performances or theater information, whatever they would be most likely to want to look up. And so the, the issue here is if you're looking for movies online, it's usually highlighted. These, these um, screenshots are from the time of the study in 01 and 02, but actually this is very similar if you go on Yahoo today, I, I checked. And so movies is highlighted directly, so you could click on that link directly. Whereas for theater, you have to guess that you would have to um, go into arts and humanities and then click on um, performing arts and then get to theater. So it's, it's harder to find um, if you're following these links. Or there was a local portal that a lot of people used where actually movies and theater are available at the same level. But then if you click on movies, you get uh, you're directed to a database of movie times. Whereas if you click on theater, you go to another page where you have to guess that you need to click on this link where you get to another page where you then have to click on another link for schedules. And so, um, yes, movie listings are easier to find. In fact, those who are looking for movies, 90% uh, were able to complete that task versus those who are looking for theater information were much less successful. Now you could argue that, um, well, it's probably older people who are not looking for movies, and we saw from the previous analyses that age matters. But in fact, these, um, these findings are robust even if you control for the various individual characteristics. Now, you could also say, well, this isn't surprising because we know that the movie industry is much more centrally organized, and so, well, so this is predictable. That's fine. All I'm trying to show is that the way industries are organized offline is actually mirrored online. So there isn't necessarily this, there aren't necessarily these new opportunities because these offline organizations are actually mirrored online. Just another one very quickly. Um, how does AOL, does AOL matter? So there was a question about finding local information and AOL, ha this is the AOL interface where they have this link to local news and if you click on that, I don't know if you can read this, but there's a New York, a North Jersey, and a Philadelphia link. But if you live in Central Jersey, what do you do? Um, there isn't a local guide for you. And so that might influence how easily people are able to find information. And I actually ran statistical analyses, and there was a, there was a distinct AOL effect. So people who used AOL for the, all of the, the more they used AOL, the less likely they were to complete tests, actually. Again, controlling for all those individual characteristics. So I, I have much more evidence to draw these conclusions. Um, didn't have time to show you. But basically, I find that website organization does matter. But if you have good skills, then you're less likely to be influenced by those, those constraints of website organization. And I just have one more slide. Um, so the next question, so in my work, initially I was interested in skill as a dependent variable. What predicts differences in skill? Because that's something no one had studied before. Um, but really the next step is to see, well, in the end, does it matter that you have better skills? Does that influence anything? And so I'm not going to give you the details of the study, but I, I did some data collection last fall where I had a measure of skill survey questions that I derived from my previous work. Um, and basically found, and I was predicting what I call capital enhancing uses of the web. So do you look for news and um, health information, jobs, et cetera. And basically what we find here is that skill is very important. So the higher, the better your skills, the more capital enhancing websites you visit. Um, anyway, I'm sorry, I completely had to rush through that. If people are interested, I'm very happy to talk about that study in more detail. But basically the overall conclusion from my work is that differences in skill do matter and um, it's definitely not just access that might be a concern when it comes to digital inequality. So thank you and you can get copies of pretty much all my papers on that website and um, Misha mentioned my mailing list so that's where you can sign up if you're interested. Thank you. Hi, 
I too want to say what an honor and a pleasure it is to be here. I've really had a wonderful time so far and uh, hope I can continue somehow in that vein. Um, my, the title of my talk is uh, From Freedom to the Management of Personally Identified Information Toward a Political Economy of Privacy and Identity. Um, what I'm trying to do in this talk is uh, to first present a little bit of theory on, on how we might think of, how we might understand uh, the uh, current practices of personal information management, um, and then uh, talk about an, a case study, a narrative uh, that of attempts to develop and sell certain privacy products to intervene in that process. Um, and then uh, a discussion of why each product either succeeded or failed, and uh, talk about the kinds of power each product might have mediated. And, so f and then finally, to bring this all together, uh, to attempt to understand what this particular narrative can tell us about the uses and the regulation of privacy and of identity. OK, so let me start with the um, theoretical uh, groundwork here. Um, I study surveillance, all right, I, and I use surveillance as, as sort of my grounding um, theory here. And by surveillance, I mean a very particular, I have a very particular definition that, that I mean by surveillance. I mean a, pro a four-stage process of uh, first, individuation and identification. So in the surveillance process, uh, every entity would be given a unique identifier, basically. First, you figure out what we mean by entity and then you give each entity an, a unique identifier so you can tell when the thing you're seeing today is the same thing you were seeing yesterday. So social security numbers, biometrics, cookies, uh, and, and things like that, They're, that's the individual identifier. And then uh, you establish systems for tracking and monitoring, keeping an ongoing database of, uh, of what each entity did. The third stage of the process is a statistical analysis of, uh, of that, all that data that was gathered. And finally, the fourth uh, stage of the process to actually respond to individuals based on the models that, that you created in that analysis. Um, this is a, a technique, surveillance is a technique that produces social identities. It produces categories of things, and it also produce, produces social relationships. It, it creates, it constructs relationships between different categories and ways to act, uh, uh, the ability to act on people as certain, uh, as certain things. Uh, as such, it mediates social power. I just want to give an example to sort of ground that. I mean, you know, you're soaking it. Uh, surveillance is everywhere. Um, you go to the Wall Street Journal online, and the Wall Street Journal online will. Can y'all hear me? Okay. The Wall Street Journal online will use cookies to uniquely identify each user, and then they will use those cookies to monitor and track each user's traversal of their site. Um, that information that they gather through that monitoring is used to, play, to first construct uh, these eight categories and then place each user into one of them. And the categories, I think, are fascinating. Uh, they're car buffs, consumer techies, engaged investors, health enthusiasts, the leisure-minded, here's the category that I, I desperately want to belong to, um, <laughs> mutual fund aficionados. I just, I want to spend my life being a mutual fund aficionado. Um, the, uh, other categories are opinion leaders or travel seekers. Um, so, and then this, categor this categorical identification becomes the, the knowledge that guides the treatment of each individual. If you are classified as a car buff, you get the car buff ads. If you are classified as an engaged investor, you get the engaged investor ads. All right, so, so again, it's a process of individuation, monitoring, uh, analysis, and response. Uh, surveillance is uh, by no means, you know, it's, it's by no means the only possible technique for knowledge production. It's not the only possible technique for the construction of identities, but it's becoming more and more pervasive in, in more and more realms of life. Uh, it's becoming more and more dominant. And uh, it makes the world go round. So, so I, part of my um, uh, academic project, uh, my scholarly project, is to really move the talk away from privacy. All right, privacy has been the, the way that we talk about this, about these things that are happening, and, and I just think it's it's got to we got to make it 
bigger than this. And so I really want to talk about surveillance and talk about the whole, talk about the whole thing. All right, talk about the whole thing that's happening. And uh, what I want to do uh, is sort of, the other thing I want to do is, is to accept surveillance as a given. All right, it's, it is what makes the world go round. All right, and then think about ways that you can perhaps embrace surveillance or subvert the surveillance process, engage in it in, in, uh, in uh, subversive ways, per per perhaps. Um, I want to perhaps discover possible configurations of uh, particular practices of surveillance, that is, particular practices of identification, of tracking, of monitoring, of response, that might produce knowledge, that might be possible of producing knowledges that are not domineering or, or oppressive. One of, the, one of the big questions I have is, can the surveillance process, can it be used? I mean, in some ideal way, can we think of ways that the surveillance process can be used to produce knowledges, produ uh, produce identities that are not domineering, that are not oppressive, but can perhaps be used by the known population itself? in order to make sense of the world uh, from alternative perspectives, uh, to, main, to use this surveillance process to, to maintain and create subcultural identities and to articulate those identities within a larger social order. Um, to in, in fact, to produce uh, identities that are perhaps transgressive, contingent, uh, to produce regenerative places and communities, Th this is the larger question that I have. So in looking at that, that larger question, I thought, well, you know, who, what kind of theorists actually work with, with uh, identity? Um, and so I, I go to people like uh, Judith Butler and, and uh, queer theory, performance theory, um, uh, Goffman, Irving Goffman. Um, so drawing on these sort of people, I think, uh, identities, identities are always performed towards certain ideals. All right. We don't wake up and decide to perform a certain identity. You know, you know, we're taught. Uh, we are taught what the, what a real man does, and so you know, you perform toward these ideals of real manliness or you know, real real queerness these days. Um, and, and identities are also performed in certain contexts, and they're performed using certain resources. Again, this is very Goffman-esque, really. Um, so uh, I wonder what resources should information environments, should for surveillance environments make available for transgressive performances? Um, lately, I've been thinking that, that these are the type of uh, resources that me, we might want to have. Uh, mirrors, OK? It's nice to see yourself, see what you're doing. So what do I look like? You know, if I'm going to go out performing, I'd like to know, you know how I look, how I look. How, how do you read me? You know, does this read? You know, do I go? Um, and uh, so, uh, so that's one thing. There's this mirrors a, a knowledge of, of what kind of data you're giving off and, and to whom. Um, also, to know what kind of categories uh, of identity, what kind of ideal identities are available for appropriation. What you know, what can I act like in a way that you will understand? You'll understand my performance if, if I if I give you these signals. Um, we can, uh, Goffman says, you know, we, we all can improvise the waiter and diner relationship because it's a well-established, it's a common, it's a public ideal. Uh, gender play is really powerful because the rules and the roles that are being bent in gender play, they're so well-established. They're so well-established that you know what roles are being played with, you know what, what rules are being bent. Um, so. Uh, they be, and they become available. The ideal roles, if they're public, they become available for play. They become available for sort of queer appropriation. But um, did any of you know that you had the possibility of claiming the identity mutual fund aficionado? You know? It, no. It's hard to play with that. It's hard to play with that unless you know that, that it's happening to you. Um, so, so I think in an ideal environment, it might be nice to, to, have this, to, to make these kind of ideals public, if you will. Um, a, a second, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, third uh, desiderata here, um, the ability to adapt your performance to context, that we're, we're, we're all performing different identities in different places, we stand in different roles uh, to different people, so we want to we actually perform different identities in different contexts. Um, finally, uh, an acknowledgement that identities and performances are not created in isolation, that meaning is created in community. So. Um, 
I, I want to suggest that, uh, that two essential criteria for a sort of democratic or, or available, publicly available um, information infrastructure is, is the ability to exchange signals within a, a subculture, the, the ability to say, oh, you're, you're one of me, you know, got it, you know, to exchange in-jokes, sort of, to have the, to, to say the same thing among a group of people and yet only have certain people pick up the, the hairpin that you just dropped. Uh, that itself was a hairpin. Um, uh, uh, so, um, the, uh, and, and, this, and the second criteria for this kind of, su this, uh, this cultural, this, this subcultural sharing, if you will, um, is, is a public environment, is an actual public environment with which to engage. Uh, and I don't, I don't want to talk about what I mean by that because it would take too long, so, so I'm not going to. Um, all right, so that's some kind, uh, some kind of idea of the type of resources that a surveillance infrastructure has to provide in order to support what I'm calling subcultural knowledge production. And I just want to say, it's funny that I feel a need to keep saying this. See how I'm not talking about privacy? You know, it's, it's like talking about the digital divide. You don't want to talk about the digital divide, but you've got to put it in, in your keywords um, so that you can so show that you're not talking about it. Um, anyway. So the next part of the project is, well, how do we get there? Isn't this a lovely ideal? You know, fine, you have this ideal. What on earth do you mean by it in practice? You know, you know what, what, would, what would this really look like? Um, what kind of, uh, uh, and, and how would you get there? What are the social and political forces that shape information infrastructure? And, and by infrastructure, what I'm talking about is the intertwining of laws and institutions and economics and culture and everyday practice that, in fact, shape and mediate law and institutions and, and economics and culture and everyday practice. Uh, I hate to do it, but Bauker and Starr do it, so I will. I will going to verb gerund this, I guess. It's not even a gerund. I don't know what it is. So anyway, I'm going to talk about a, the case study, our, our attempt at infrastructuring. Uh, new identification practices. All right, so I'm going to talk about a particular company that tried to develop these uh, private. They, they were developing privacy uh, technologies, and they tried to uh, they tried to sell them. They developed these products and tried to sell them. And uh, in the course of their failures to sell each one, they they, they developed new ones. And and so I'm uh, so I'm trying to sort of just tell a narrative of how they tried to engage uh, uh, the the the. Uh, uh, legal and economic uh, structures. So uh, the, the uh, company is actually called Zero Knowledge Systems. Uh, they are a company, in, uh, they, they still exist uh, in Montreal. They were founded in, in about 1997 by two brothers. I think they were in their late 20s. Uh, and they had just made several million dollars by uh, founding and selling an ISP in Montreal. So they had founded uh, an ISP, they had sold an ISP. I think they had money anyway, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, and, they, and they started looking around for their next venture. Wh what, what are they going to do now, now that they're no longer uh, running an ISP? And in looking for their, their next venture, uh, they notice that, that there's, that they, they believe that they find an unmet consumer demand in privacy. Because all of, the goal, all of the polls are saying the reason people aren't spending online is because they, they are afraid of, of privacy. So they think, you know, if we can satisfy this consumer demand for privacy, then more people are going to buy online, la, la, la. Everything is, everything's going to be great, all right? People really want privacy online. Um, and they also in their market exploration, they discover a really vital, a really vital and active and, you know, to my mind, fascinating. I have to say, you know, my, my heart is really in this to a large extent. Um, a, a vital cryptography and uh, privacy uh, advocate community. It's, it's a very hot time. This is the late 90s, and it really is a hot time for cryptography and privacy. It's really very interesting stuff is going on. Um, so uh, about mid-1998, uh, they um, recruit crypto geeks, cryptographers, um, who, uh, to, to develop this, um, a product that they're calling Freedom. Okay. Uh, and this is the, this is the, 
basic user interface for freedom. This is what freedom will look like when, when you use it. Uh, you log on and you'll choose one of several NIMs. You, could ha you, you, you first establish several NIMs. You say, okay, I'm either going to be David or I'm going to be Dr. Phillips or I'm going to be Antoine. All right. So I would log on and I say, today I am Antoine. And I go forth on the web as Antoine at freedom.net. All right. And I do whatever Antoine does. And then when I'm done being Antoine, I log off as Antoine. And I log back in as Dr. Phillips. And I talk to my, you know, I talk to my students. You know, and, uh, and then I, when I'm done talking to my students, I log off as Dr. Phillips. And then, and then, and then you know, I go either go back to Antoine or, or um, choose another NIM. Anyway, so you have a different NIM, a different persona, if you will, for uh, each internet session. Um, and they're really unlinkable. I mean, I mean, that, that they, uh, you really can't tell uh, looking at the system. It, it's sort of mathematically, cryptographically impossible to either tell what body is actually clicking on the keyboard, you know, where, where the messages from Antoine are coming from, or to show that the messages from Antoine are coming from the same keyboard as the messages from Dr. Phillips. All right? It, it's really virtually impossible to do that. Um, and the, the technique that they use to do this is a cloud of networked anonymizing servers. So each, uh, each message basically gets uh, shipped from server to server to server to server to server, uh, being cryptographically acted upon on each of those servers, and eventually popping out the other end of this anonymizing cloud. So, so the root of each message is hidden, as well as the content of each message. Uh, not, and importantly, not even zero knowledge, not even the company that actually operates this network can, can trace any of the messages in it. Um, the economics, the way they were trying to sell it was as a subscription service uh, for $50 a year for up to five pseudonyms. Um, but the, the client, the front end into the network, the front end into the network was also going to be used as a platform for other zero knowledge offerings. Because zero knowledge, they wanted not only to uh, make money on this, on this pseudonyms, they wanted to control the privacy space. They had this idea that there was, they could create a privacy space. This is, this is uh, uh, what? capitalist talk, this business talk. They, they, they create these spaces, and they're going to control these spaces. They were going to be AT&T. They are going to be the AT&T of the 21st century. In their more humble moments, they said, well, Dolby. Okay? No one knows what Dolby does. No one knows what Dolby does. But you wouldn't buy, uh, you wouldn't buy a stereo equipment uh, without a Dolby sticker on it, right? And you see Dolby at the end of all the movies and everything. You know, people use Dolby. It's well integrated. Um, they wanted to, they were saying that every internet Every internet um, appliance uh, would be would have a little zero knowledge sticker on it, privacy enabled. All right, this is this is what the, the grand plan was. Um, to that end, uh, they licensed really basic cryptographic patents. Really, um, again, without without being real clear about what these patents do, just kind of take my word for it. They are um, they're really fundamental cryptographic patents that zero knowledge controlled, they, they licensed. Um, so uh, they could then look for investors. This is what they wanted to do. They wanted to look for investors. And, and uh, they would sell this space to investors by the quality of their technology, because freedom really was cutting edge technology. All right? it, it, really, it, was a, it was really impressive um, uh, that they were able to, to create that anonymizing cloud as well as they did. Um, they had a brilliant team. A brilliant team, uh, especially in their cryptography, especially their cryptography team, was, was really brilliant and, and extremely reputable. Um, but they also had privacy uh, policy people. You know, they, they would hire uh, uh, privacy commissioners. A really well-known privacy commissioner was on, was on the staff there. Um, the same person who, who did uh, open source when, when Netscape went open source, um, he was there. Anyway, the, and they had very, they, they had great brand perception. They were very hot. They were on 60 Minutes. Uh, the, the, one of the founders was testifying before Congress. Um, uh, they, they were in the press a lot. Um, but that recognition was mostly, um, well, th th there was recognition that they were the most sophisticated privacy technologists around. Um, and, and they also held forth the possibility of changing the world while getting rich. Uh, hard to, uh, hard to, uh, uh, it's very attractive. It was very attractive. <laughs> it really was. Um, 
to give you just, uh, so the strategic goal was an IPO, right? So, the, so they'd be awash in a lot of money. Also, freedom itself, the freedom network would be a cash cow. Uh, people were going to buy th these things. It was going to be a cash cow. And that would give them the, the, the money, the, the, the ability, really, to uh, extend forth into the rest of the privacy space with things like electronic cash uh, and anonymous certificates and things like that. It was, it was, very, it was a very exuberant time. Um, and, it, and it really was, let, let me tell you, tremendously attractive. Uh, uh, this was the time of the internet boom. You know, it was before the bust. Uh, fortunes really were being made, or at least it looked like fortunes were being made. Um, and uh, privacy was, at the time, a, a salient media issue. I mean, you could, it was in the paper. Um, and uh, crypto activists actually had had policy influence in the early 90s. So, so I, I've been writing this up now and thinking, how could they, you know, pfft, you know, how could they believe this pipe dream? But at the time, it, it was real. It, so anyway, January 2000, they, they, they first release uh, Freedom. And they also then decide to hire a marketing department. This is just a, a clue as to how they thought, how much they thought this was just going to go. Of course, it's going to go. People are going to buy it. They're, you know, people are going to get email. It's going to spread virally. People are going to get email that says, freedom privacy enabled. You know, to get yours, click on this website. And people are just going to get email that said that. They were going to go to the freedom site. They were going to buy it themselves. Uh, but anyway, uh, they, they hired a marketing department sort of as they released it. Um, in April 2000, duh, the dot-com bust. And there were very poor sales. I mean, it, no one bought it. No one bought it is, is kind of the short story. Um, no one bought it, and, and they became increasingly confused and desperate. Why? Because everyone loved them. You know, it really looked like everyone loved them, and yet no one was buying their their software. Um, as the as the uh, so the, so that they had the founder muttering on TV. Everybody, everybody says they care about privacy, but they'd give a free DNA. They'd give away a DNA sample for a free Big Mac, and <laughs> it's true. You know, they'd line up around the block. Uh, so, at about this time, an internet marketing company uh, recognized that, that they had a PR problem because they always claimed that they didn't collect personally identified information, um, and yet either they kind of did or, <laughs> or they really, really wanted to. I'm not exactly sure which, but they definitely wanted to collect personally identified information and kind of pretend that they weren't. Um, so, Zero Knowledge was recognized as the leader in this field, so they came to Zero Knowledge and said, can you, can you help us with this? And Zero Knowledge then recognized this as an as as opportunity for um, another market. And so they began to develop a, a system that they called Blind Elephant. Uh, what Blind Elephant was, was a, um, a, a, a blinding engine for databases. Um, a database operator would cryptographically blind certain fields, so usually the personally identified fields. So, so for example, um, if you had all these records that were indexed by social security numbers, and, and suppose that the social security number is the only thing that personally identifies each record, you would blind, uh, you cryptographically blind the social security number, so it would, it would uh, become, it would hash to or transform to another number. All right, and you couldn't get from the blind value to the social security number. You couldn't get back this way. But the same social security number would hash to the same blinding number. So that is, you could tell, you could, if you looked at this database, you could say, ah, this individual with this blinding value did all of these things. All right, but we don't know who that individual is. Uh, all right, so, okay. So, um, and also, uh, also in certain circumstances, uh, you could, in fact, return to the personally identifying information. So what, what they hoped that this would do would be that it would allow statistical analysis. It would, allow, it would allow statistical analysis of all these databases. And also, it would allow uh, targeted marketing. Um, that is, because you could send the mailing. You could, you could get back, but, but you could only get back if you held a certain key. So there was a way, uh, ideally, for the data subject to say, I will only release, you know, I will only allow you to get back to my name under certain circumstances. So you could have a trusted third party who would control the ability to get from the hash value back to the regular value. Um, so, th so they started developing that for a while. Um, uh, Freedom sales were still stalled. They weren't going anywhere. No, nobody was buying Freedom, which is a, a cry and shame. I liked Freedom. I did. 
Um, and I speak as Antoine there. Uh, so uh, so the, 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 they then attempted to distribute freedom through OEMs, through uh, original equipment manufacturers. They wanted to you know, put it onto hard drives when, it, uh, when people unpacked their um, computers. And so in order to make it attractive to OEMs, in order to make it attractive to Hewlett Packard, um, they bundled additional features like form fillers, uh, firewalls, a cookie manager, uh, you know, this, the Norton utilities basically, or, or the semantic utilities. Um, they started bundling those kind of things with it. And then uh, they would give away that part for free uh, in order to get people to at least know that they existed and say, so they can say, we also offer anonymous uh, browsing click here to subscribe to that. Um, in early 2001, they uh, hired a new CEO and a new management team, in fact, from California. And uh, the, oddly enough, massive layoffs occurred. The new management team came in and said, you guys, um, you, this won't do. Uh, and so massive layoffs began. Um, by August of that year, August of 2001, uh, they looked at the $56 million in losses that they had occurred, incurred over three years, and they basically decided to retreat from crypto entirely, that they're out of the crypto business. Uh, okay, I could go on, but I won't. Um, so they retreat from the crypto uh, business, and they, uh, they shut down the Freedom Network, they released the patents that they held, they had been licensing these, these fundamental crypto patents, they, they released them back to the, uh, to the developer. Um, and they really gave up this idea of control of the privacy space. They gave it up entirely in terms of let's survive, you know, let's make it through to next year. Um, and so, uh, and also they changed, in face of industry indifference toward Blind Elephant, because remember Blind Elephant was a cryptographic, it, it, was, it was crypto in Blind Elephant. Um, and uh, what they did was change Blind Elephant basically to uh, en an enterprise privacy manager. And what EPM did, it was a software tool that was basically designed to digitalize and rationalize privacy policy so that if you were a privacy officer of a company, you had a way, you just had a way of talking about your privacy policy and matching your policy to your practices to say, are we doing what we said we were going to be doing? All right, it, it's just, it was just a markup language. Okay, uh, EPML is a markup language for describing policy, uh, privacy policy practices. Uh, they had new, cr their criteria for success, they were co-developing that with IBM, by the way. Um, their uh, new criteria for success were two. On the, for the, on the consumer side, they just wanted to be a distant third to Symantec and McAfee. Uh, on the enterprise side, they just wanted to, to ride rather than to be eaten by IBM. All right. They, they wanted to, to get IBM to give them some kind of licensing fees for, uh, for the, the uh, EPM that they were developing together. All right, so, so why did these things fail or succeed? Um, freedom was wildly expensive to operate. It was difficult to use. It was unclear why one was using it, unless you were somebody like me who kind of thought it was interesting to be Antoine today and Dr. Phillips tomorrow. It, it really wasn't clear why you would be Antoine today, and I liked I, you know, I like gnarling with that problem, so I kept doing it. But uh, most people just say, this is stupid, and stop doing it. And uh, as someone else put it, it was a problem from which no one suffered. Privacy was an issue. It wasn't a problem. Um, so a Blind Elephant failed because basically data holders would not give up their right to control the data. They weren't going to give the keys to that data to a third party. No. Why? No. Um, and they would not recognize the data subject's right to privacy. They, in fact, uh, zero knowledge changed the name from privacy rights management to enterprise privacy management to get rid of the whole concept of rights because people, the, the businesses would not buy this notion of rights. Um, EPM uh, was potentially successful, and I think it has been to an extent successful, uh, basically because the financial health and other industries actually are subject to privacy regulation. Um, and they have to, they actually must uh, monitor their own compliance. And so it actually is a useful tool for things that uh, uh, people must do. Uh, also, um, the, uh, now with uh, TI, since 2000, uh, since September 11th, with the, with the genesis of things like total information awareness, CAPS, this kind of data mining, there have been um, critics of uh, TIA and, and CAPS who say that these would be okay 
If only the data were blinded, all right? Or if only there were auditing, uh, auditing trails. So, so the kind of enterprise products that, in fact, zero knowledge was, uh, was trying to, to develop actually might have a market now. And I, and I think there's an irony here that they've gone from traveling with Ayn Rand to traveling with John Poindexter. Um, so uh, I, I, okay, I gotta be really brief here. Um, these, the, to talk about how these fit into a surveillance process, they were all about identification, okay? All of them were about identification. All of them were interventions into the, that, that first little part of the surveillance process. Uh, they weren't really interventions into tracking or analysis. They were, t they were about identification. Um, although that certainly had implications for analysis and response. Um, I, I got to get to the end of this. Um, let me say in particular that none of the systems really did anything to make the context of performance visible. I mean, it, this just wasn't on the screen. It wasn't on the screen as far as what privacy is. Uh, none of them did anything to make the context of performances visible. It was not, it, it didn't do anything to talk about for whom one was performing, uh, what was being made of one's performance. None of them recognized or addressed the social construction of identities, the, the ability to, the ability to, to, um, to uh, form communities with others to, to have certain social identities, to perform certain social identities. And throughout it, there was actually an ever diminishing protection of an empowerment of the individual from uh, from freedom, which oh, the individual law, sovereign individual, you know, uh, controlling everything that everybody sees, to uh, blind elephants as well, through a trusted third party, to um, to EPM, which was whatever whatever you know the regulations say. That's fine by me. Um, so, uh, what does this tell us about the the politics, the economics of power and identity? First, um, the successful in intervention into the infrastructures uh, really facilitated and supported relations between the state and data holders. Um, there, there was no market for privacy. Uh, data holders would, will, will limit their data usage only as far as required by law. And, and I, think this is, I think this is actually kind of an important point. Um, and, and it, it uh, echoes uh, Jeffrey's point that regulation really is important. Uh, it really is important. But laws tend only pr to protect personally, identifi personally identifiable information. And then they tend to have huge exceptions for access in, in various conditions. So uh, laws have no bearing yet, okay? Laws have no bearing on information used for stati statistical knowledge production, for the creation or, or segregation of types, for figuring out what a terrorist is, you know? As I understand it, the laws nowadays, if you blind the data, if you blind the data, you can look for patterns in it till the cows come home. You can look for what people like that are like and what people like that do, uh, all you want. Um, and I also want to say that these types, the categories, the information environment from which they are mined, they remain private property. The databases uh, remain private property. The uh, algorithms that are used to make sense of these databases uh, remain a private property, basically. There, there's really no, and none of these things addressed the, the um, a public commons, a commons uh, from which we can, with which we can, in communion, uh, negotiate uh, identity, roles, relationships. Thank you. question about privacy is this, what is the threshold of privacy we all need? How to, to paraphrase Tolstoy, how much privacy does a man need? It's not yes or no situation, right? We began this fascinating discussion right before the panel began. Uh, and it's an important question that relates to some thoughts I had after David's very interesting presentation. Uh, the answer is that different cultures demand different kinds of privacy. And the idea that there's any abstract agreement about how much is needed is not supported by the evidence. Why did zero knowledge fail? I'm so glad that he told that story. Uh, I was also devastated by the failure of zero knowledge uh, because I was one of those consultants who was going to become rich based on its uh, <laughs> success. It was like, the greatest tragedy that I ever heard. Uh, it was, it was a terrible, just a loss for our nation and for me personally. Uh, so why, did, why was there no market for anonymizing technologies in America? 
Uh, I think it's because Americans have a very strong uh, bias uh, in favor of fearing the government, but indifference to surveillance by the private sector. And that's why we don't have broad privacy laws that regulate the amount of data sharing in the private sector. And the same libertarians who were giving John Ashcroft trouble have opposed uh, regulation of uh, consumer data sharing. By contrast, in Europe, the situation is reversed. They're very concerned about the dignity of the consumer and the individual and pretty indifferent to surveillance by the state. So in France, uh, laws regulate what uh, companies can do with data sharing but don't regulate what the police can do. So all this suggests that uh, different countries strike a different balance and that uh, any kind of generalization is wrong. Now, does that mean that privacy is uh, irrelevant or a d distraction, uh, as, as David suggested, when we think about identity management? Maybe, maybe I, I think not. Uh, but it just means that different values are at stake, and it may be more profitable to talk more precisely about classification, about dignity, about autonomy, about being judged out of context, all of which are different values that privacy protects, rather than using a more broad term. Yeah, I, I'd like to uh, respond to that, too. Uh, you know, again, by trying to reframe the question and, and, and say it, it doesn't really, uh, the, pri the privacy means so many things uh, in so many contexts that, um, it, it's not. It's an unanswerable question, uh, and what's I look at it politically. I mean, I, ca I came to zero knowledge. I, there I was, a gay man. I was a gay man using all these pseudonyms, and I and what happened was I kept thinking, this feels a lot like the closet. Why am I hiding this? You know, why am I hiding this? Why do I want this to be over here and that to be over there? And there are many, many reasons for doing that. But what I kept bumping up against was the reasons for not doing that, the reasons for being public. Um, and so, so to say how much privacy do I need it sort of means, well, who are you? You know, who are you and what are you trying to do? Um, and, uh, and where are you? you know, who are you, where are you, what are you trying to do in that context? Uh, and so I'll leave it there. John? He, he actually said yeah. he had a vision yeah. of the right question. Uh, and second question. Oh. Yes. Uh, that's about uh, the digital divide. Uh, if cell phone becomes uh, widely available and broadband, what will happen to the digital divide? And what will be the impact if, uh, if the divide vanishes from American society? For right. Well, um, so I think we're... Okay, it's, regarding cell phones, it's a little hard to address because we don't have the kind of data that we have on internet use. So, um, I mean, obviously it's very widespread, but I, um, so I, I can't address it in terms of, you know, how it breaks down by segments of population, et cetera. But um, obviously it's very widespread. We know much less about what kinds of services people are signing up for. and. I suspect you're referring to things like having web access on a cell phone, for example, right? Um, I mean, that, again, is still quite expensive. That also comes with lots of charges. Um, one point that I didn't come back to that I should have finished with was that um, part of the point of my work on skill is to show that even if we, even if the, if when it, even if penetration wasn't just 60%, even if it was 90%, the point is that other differences remain. So. There are lots of differences in terms of how people are able to use the medium. And even if you reach, even if you were to reach 100% penetration, which we won't, um, these skill differences will remain. And in fact, will be even larger is what I would suspect because given that education and income are some of the predictors of skill in the first place, as people who have lower education and lower income become part of the user population, that means that skill will probably be even large, there will be a larger variance in people's skill. So I think there will definitely remain inequality. It won't be this binary divide, but it'll be an inequality in what you're able to make of the use of the medium. Esther, I just want to follow up on a bit. I mean, it, I, I, it may be odd to draw something encouraging from your message. Um, but I, I think the thing I'm coming back to is that the issue isn't the, the digital inequality, it's the digital inequality in relationship to the economic inequality. If we could show that more people have access um, to the technology or to the, to the web than would be predicted by the economic inequality, which seems to be one of the, the, 
seems to be a, a given or, or taken as, uh, for granted here, um, then there's some hope, some sign of encouragement. And the, and the part that I was going to focus on, because I, I come from a faculty of education and I work with teachers, and we are very interested in our responsibilities with regard to uh, equality of access, uh, and the schools are one site, of, of, in some communities at least, of greater equality of access than, along with the public libraries. So, so I was taking a grain of hope, and I hope not to elusively, um, around the, the notion of, of skills. So that the possibility of increasing uh, students' skills using the internet in relationship to, I mean, the predictable inequalities of income and the predictable inequalities of education, but the possibility that we could at least among a larger population than you would predict right now, increase their skills of access, that we would be making some kind of inroad? I think the possibility is definitely there. I mean, I don't want to take a completely negative view at all. I think the possibility is there. In fact, a project, a future project that I'm going to do, um, that I'm preparing right now, has an intervention component where I actually want to work with students from low-income backgrounds where we, um, we introduce a training component, right? There's an intervention. And um, I know some people in the audience probably disagree with this from conversations yesterday, but I do think that there is actually room, a lot of room for training and that that's something important. I don't see it happening right now. I mean, I, I have an interesting cartoon that has um, computers in the back of a classroom and they're all asleep. And it just shows that classrooms have computers and most schools are wired, but they're not being used a lot. And also, our teachers, do teachers have the skills even to train the students in the first That's place? So, yeah. so there, I mean, there are a lot of points, that, extra little steps but that hap the, have to happen. The encouraging sign, empirically, is, is the response to health information. My, my impression is that, that the access to, to health information exceeds what would be predicted by the kind of data that you're presenting. Was it the access in terms of what's available, or what these in students are actually accessing. I mean, are they well, there, there are a couple of things. There, uh, there is the, the data from the Pew Foundation on the, the percentage or the number of people, me, the number of people who are accessing, who are claiming to access health information. There are huge anecdotal records of doctors and physicians being faced by patients with certainly you know misinterpreted and, and uh, ill-placed information, but but certainly reflecting some engagement and interest. And as an educator, the interesting thing for me is that, and based on reading levels, there should be almost no public access of medical information because of, of you know, discrepancies around skill levels. Mm -hmm. And so again, it, it, it's, a, it's a slight kind of indicator that something different might be afoot in terms of people's access of health information and their utilization of it. Right, and just one more point on that is something I did not have in my study that I will in future iterations is I didn't look at people's evaluation of the information and that especially with something like health information is crucial, right? Be, and it could be seen as part of skill as well because there's so much information out there that's incorrect and that's not really going to advantage anyone if they're getting incorrect information. Sure. Ben, um, well, I've had all, all three presentations were extremely interesting. I actually had a question for you, but can I, can I do two? <laughs> 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 um, first, I, I, you've got, you got a lot of questions, so let me, let me just throw this one. Um, I, I, mean, I, pre I completely appreciate your argument about the importance of skill, but I'm wondering um, about some of the uh, maybe more structural issues with, uh, in, with uh, digital inequality. In particular, I'm thinking of the way in which uh, access, uh, online access, access to the internet, uh, has become increasingly treated as a uh, as market commodity. And thinking, I'm not sure this example is correct, this kind of mind. I only know about it through a friend who went on a tirade about it, but I think the city of Philadelphia has a public wireless project uh, where they, it was a public, public access wire to the city, and the Pennsylvania State Legislature has now passed a law saying this can't be done anywhere else uh, at the request of the public company. So, you know, there's an active suppression of kind of open, open public access to the internet. Um, so I'm just, I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure there's a real question there, but I'm just wondering about some of the structural issues that underlie in all this you're talking about. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think there are definitely structural issues. And I'm sorry, did you want to well, add I'm something? Just my second question. Oh, okay. Um, well, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, I, I just, um, I'm wondering about the, uh, with, with, the first, with the first year points about the, the 
efficaciousness of regulation, in particular, so the temporal limitations on the storage of, of all sorts of data, particularly from surveillance cameras. Um, and actually, my, you know, my first thought is, uh, it was actually something that Joe Turkey talked about optimistically yesterday, but pessimistic, I'm being as pessimistic, but after that, why should I have any confidence that the government is going, or the government or any state agency is actually going to distort this data when you can easily make multiple copies of it, um, which can be sorted in the Uh, absolutely. Uh, as uh, Woody Allen said, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. <laughs> and uh, it's professional paranoids who have been most effective in uh, the privacy debate. They're my heroes. The civil libertarian liberals and libertarian conservatives basically have taken the position that uh, we can't trust the government under any circumstances, and therefore we have to stop the machines from going up to begin with. Mm -hmm. Now, in the surveillance camera setting, I incline toward that paranoid position not only because I don't uh, trust the government to abide by its uh, regulations, although the examples in Britain confirm that lack of trust. There have been lots of cases of statewide images that have shown up on reality TV shows that have been sold and so forth, but more because the whole thing seems like a, a feel-good technology. It's a, it's a completely uh, fake promise, and when you just engage in a thoughtful cost-benefit analysis of the security benefits versus the privacy harms, Surveillance cameras seem like an easy one because the empirical case against their effectiveness is so strong. But I wouldn't ar urge the uh, paranoid position more broadly. And in fact, this talk arose out of uh, my second book, which uh, itself arose out of a challenge from Le L Lawrence Lessig, Larry Lessig, who's a teacher and friend of mine. And we were on a panel about surveillance cameras, and I basically made the the, the case that you did saying that the data will be shared, we have to stop the stuff from going up to begin with, and he politely but firmly called me a Luddite. He said, you know, these technologies are going to proliferate whether you like it. Well, no, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> in his mind it was, but no. I was delighted to embrace it, absolutely. It was the nicest thing that anyone had said about me uh, that morning, in fact. It was a pretty rough panel. But he said these technologies are going to proliferate whether you like it or not, so you better learn enough about them to be able to make a case for distinguishing the good from the bad ones. So I took this challenge seriously and spent a year trying to learn enough about uh, data mining and biometrics to be able to describe what blob rather than naked machine technologies look like. I became convinced for the reasons I talked about this morning that it's possible to set up the good systems in most cases, and I'm concerned that the paranoid position, which is the only real political constituency that privacy has, may make it harder to adopt the kind of balanced compromises that would in fact protect privacy and security at the same time. So the caps maybe is a, a exception, but the Patriot Act might not get amended because the paranoids don't even trust the government enough to allow for uh, trade-offs. In, in other words, yes, you can have Section 215 power, but only with use limitations. Uh, similarly, the uh, blind elephant uh, technology that David mentioned could indeed, he, he mentioned that some people think that data mining would be permissible if, it were, if the data were traceable but not identifiable and an individual could only be linked with his or her data after some kind of judicial oversight that would establish that there was good cause. Uh, the paranoids would say that we can't allow blind elephant to be implemented in the data mining sphere because uh, the connection might be made illicitly or the government might abuse the position, I would say that's, uh, you know, you, you can have oversight systems that ensure through the kind of auditing he talked about that it's being used well or not. And to take the paranoid position in that case means that we're going to get something worse. There'll be like a bad total information awareness. Be, well, it's a, it's a predictive question and the overwhelming economic pressures from the consumer sphere and the, tr and the billions of dollars that are available for uh, the uniting of private d data companies for national security uses, as Lexis and Axiom show, uh, suggests that uh, worse is to come. So uh, uh, all a way of saying that this seems to me a central debate, and you can be a paranoid on some issues and a moderate on others, but ultimately I don't think that uh, paranoia will ensure the kind of balance that is technologically and legally possible. I'd actually like to link that question to the skill question, though, because um, I see a link in that uh, Part of whether it's paranoia, or, but there, there has to be a trust in terms of how data are being dealt with, even if we assume that they will be uh, destroyed, et cetera. But there, there are actually people at various stages involved with, very, maybe not this specific case, but th there are people out there who are responsible for keeping certain parts of, our, of data they have about us. And 
those people sometimes lack the skills to be able to follow whatever rules they're supposed to be following in terms of protecting those data. So actually, there is this link that sometimes, I mean, there have, you know, these are much more trivial cases, but there have been cases where just because an administrator doesn't know how to use the BCC line on an email, you lose privacy about some, you know, much more minor issue, but you lose privacy about something because they lack the skill to use email in a way to protect people's privacy regarding some matter. So there actually, there is some link, this is just to pull our panel together. Um, <laughs> but regarding your question for, or the comment you had uh, regarding uh, structural issues, I, I wanna make sure that I'm, that I'm, that this part is clear. I'm not, I don't mean to suggest skill as this individual issue. I, I think it is very much a structural issue that it is, that it's related to these other um, social factors. So I don't, I'm not putting it on the individual at all. I, I think it's very much a structural issue. It's mostly for Jeff, but in, in, in my, I, I'm going to try to link together some ways that I think your talks relate and some ways that there seems to be kind of theories that may kind of pull apart different arguments that you've made, which I find interesting. Uh, Jeff, I was really interested in your reading of the relationship between the sort of naked machine and what you seem to suggest as a more ideal model. and and. It, it, it reads a very limited vision of what the body is and what our concerns might be about revealing the body and indeed privacy, whatever that is. And, and assumes that sort of, I'm okay with going through the machine as long as they can't gaze upon and see you know, either the sort of ugly <coughs> truth of my body or this kind of uh, controlling, regulating, erotic gaze. And, and so, I, I'm kind of troubled by the sort of not so much the blob, although I think there might be something worrisome there as well, but about the mapping of my objects, and I'm kind of wondering what the what to what level those would be onto this mannequin, mannequin, the reproduction of my body that I have no control of and that is not mine, and that would seem to read into sort of uh, feminist readings of women's imaging and things of that sort, and some of the problems were of that, what kind of mannequin is this going to be? Maybe it's just my sort of visual culture experiences of the mannequin of the past, but I would sort of expect in a way that, you know, are they going to produce sort of kind of ideas about types of bodies? You know, the older woman, the sort of the Islamic individual, or, and my initial guess, is everything is mapped against a white body. And so you sort of, are you going to reproduce this vision that's seen by some group of people that that's out of our control of the sort of the traveler, of the individual, of the sort of erotic, you know, kind of, I mean, is, is this sort of our objects, our lingerie, our whatever mapped onto this body? And so we get this sort of potentially really normative, out of control, troubling representation. And I'm, I'm kind of, I'm thinking about David's vision of sort of normative and then sort of disruption ways of using the surveillance against itself. And I, if, you know, given those, does that mean that when, you know, look, it's, a, it's another knife mapped onto a white guy. You know, so if there's this ironic way that they imagine the body of the traveler, is there a way that then sort of their kind of limited perceptions of race get skewed? So I'm kind of, I'm wondering about David, you know, what's the possibilities? I mean, I'm thinking of sort of artist interventions where it's like, mm. you know, kind of, Christian Markley, let's send that like marijuana back into Mexico, you know, or Guillermo Gomez Pena's sort of border interventions. I know it's sort of little air fake fake airplanes with like joints on them, like sent back across the border. So I'm <laughs> I didn't do it. Um, I'm I'm wondering about these the the potentials for interventions within the sort of models of surveillance and control. And I'm, I'm wondering about the sort of resistance and, and sort of decoding and sort of reusing and reading the technology differently in terms of Esther's comments about skill and about a conception of a set of skills that are necessary. So you have the sort of misreading, let's use the technology differently, let's unpack it. And then I think that there's also this idea that 
let's have a technology that we are sure that users use right. That there's a set of sort of um, models that we need to learn and that we need to embark and sort of convey on to other people. We used to have a joke which was sort of like, who would be the last person, who would take longest to log into X setting because none of us could type. And the idea was like, well, it's not even, we can't even figure it out because someone would never even manage, like I can never get my password right. And obviously there's a problem there, but I think there's also a problem of how do we go from articulating skills that are useful to training where we regulate the ways that the technologies can be used, what they're supposed to do, how we're supposed to use them, and how we're going to train sort of workers to use technologies. No, that's not what you do with email. No, that's not, you know, use, use English appropriately when writing X mail in relationship to alternative languages. The mannequin looks kind of like the Pillsbury Doughboy, the one that I saw. <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost uh, genderless uh, in, in, in that way, so it's, uh, and you could design it differently. Uh, what I've been struck, uh, no, it's a, it's a, a kind of grayish, uh, blob-like uh, thing, I think. Um, I've been so struck in giving the naked machine-like example to uh, groups of students and groups of adults by how tremendously different people's intuitions are. It does not track uh, gender uh, necessarily. Uh, it certainly doesn't track race. There is, however, an age component. It's absolutely the case that students are less concerned about being naked in public than older people are. Not because older people are more embarrassed about the fact that we look more blobbish, but because our norms of exposure have changed a whole lot. And the MTV generation is much more comfortable with the exposure for the reasons you described than are uh, people raised in a more hierarchical and more modest Era. Now, when you ask the kids what, uh, you know, whether they would prefer the naked machine to the blob machine, some actually say, I'm completely indifferent. I'm, I'm happy to be naked. A again, tracking onto your re uh, uh, intuition. You ask why, and they have different reasons. Some say, I'm an exhibitionist. I like being naked <laughs> at the airport. <laughs> they do. Some say that. Uh, others say, I'm so, I don't care. I'm already so exposed that this is a small additional indignity. And others say, I'm so afraid of flying. I'm so scared of getting onto the plane that I'll do anything. I want to ritualistically demonstrate my innocence, strip myself bare, even if I understand on some level that I could be just as safe with a blob-like machine. So, uh, and, but, and then when you ask the people who prefer to be blobs, they say, um, this is an outrage. What an indignity that for the, uh, the foolish illusion of security, I should have to go through a literal strip search. Uh, what a, what a, what a, uh, Poor trade-off, and and, uh, and 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 it does offend my modesty. So all this is to say, uh, I don't, it's not. I don't find it useful to theorize about people's intuitions about public nudity. Uh, it's more interesting to describe them. And it turns out people have huge differences in the way they perceive this. Uh, some of it's cultural, some of it's uh, based on age. But uh, I, I haven't found generalizations very very useful in predicting how people will react. I, can I uh, respond a little bit to your uh, point about intervention? Where, where, where is it possible, you know, to to engage and and, and subvert? I suggest that the airport security count, uh, count, is check in check through is not the place. Um, <laughs> and and one of the things that really really concerns me is that in fact um, there are fewer and few, that where where playfulness will get you shot. You know, y you don't play with your laser. Gun. You know, you're gonna play with your laser pointer in Grand Central Station, or you will be shot. Uh, you know, you don't you don't make jokes going through security. Jokes will be interpreted as threats, and you will be jailed. Uh, so, so one of the things that's concerning me is that is that there is less and less uh, social um, space. You know, I mean that 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 the use of the use of technologies, the control of technologies, uh, the, these systems is more and more uh, tightly tightly regulated, um, and to to really um, reduce the space for for playfulness and intervention and, and subversion. I just very briefly, I just wanted to say that when I talk about skill training, I don't think of it as teaching people what is right and what is wrong. I think of it as empowering people with showing them what is possible. And we could, you know, I could get into specifics. I, I won't know, but 
I don't think of it as a right wrong divide. Um, one question that um, brings the panel together is what does it mean to act and be acted on within the network society? And I thought what was really productive is the sense that in order to act, one produces traces, but just because one produces traces doesn't mean that one acts, right? So those people who are considered to be on the opposite of the side of the digital divide are still producing data actively through their purchase or purchases or whatnot. So there's a different way of thinking of digital inequality if we put it in relationship to surveillance. So my question to all of you is to just sort of further push as to what you were starting to do. How would we relate questions of digital inequality to surveillance, realizing that surveillance too seems to be the grounds from which certain actions are possible as well? Wonderful uh, and deep uh, question. So uh, absolutely, to uh, be uh, acted upon is to lose the ability to control your uh, boundaries of accessibility and to control the construction of your identity. So this is what these mass technologies of surveillance do. They put you in different boxes based on your uh, behavior and make it impossible for you to choose the conditions of your exposure. So that's why maybe the relation which we began to talk about is that it's not primarily a privacy violation to be classified on the basis of your data, but it is uh, an equality violation and a question of classification and exclusion. And to that degree, these technologies uh, extend to everyone the kind of discrimination that used to be visited on subcategories. So now uh, it used to be just uh, African Americans on the Jersey Turnpike who were uh, ra racially profiled. Now everyone is digitally profiled. And perhaps uh, it's the equality violation that would get people to care. They, are, they don't want to buy zero knowledge to negotiate different NIMS because they don't care about being anonymous on the net. But if a lot of people are put in yellow categories at the airport, they're going to be calling Alan Dershowitz immediately because Americans don't like to be discriminated against. So it's a very good question. I think we can profitably think harder about the connections between surveillance and exclusion. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question too, and I'm going to have to think about it um, more. But one point is that this. So I was talking about how content is organized, and that's one of those. That's that's kind of that's the acted upon I'm thinking of, right? That that's given to users. And what I didn't really emphasize in the talk, but a lot of that has to do with commercial considerations, right? It's, a lot, it's very often, it's the for-profit that's pushing certain content and that influences what comes up on search engines, on top, et cetera, et cetera. And again, maybe I didn't show quite enough evidence of this, but really what, what I'm finding is that the, the better skilled people are with respect to some aspects of internet use, the better they are at sidestepping some of what's being imposed on them. So that's how I relate it to digital inequality. Uh, I want to say that as, as uh, Oscar Gandhi always says that when you, when you target a particular segment, you are excluding uh, everyone else. So, so, that, so that this whole idea of targeted market is very much about exclusion as much as it is inclusion. And when um, the, people at zero, the people at zero knowledge would say to me, this is, this is one guy said, uh, it's a problem from which no one suffers because you don't know. <laughs> you, you don't know when you're being excluded for one thing. So to make that process visible is extremely important. Um, I had another point, but I forgot it. So. Oh, you just have to ask one more question. Oh, OK. I thought it was really good. <laughs> Esther, it seems to me that you and I are working on a very similar topic, but from different perspectives. And so I know you said you say 100 people, that the census is 100,000 is a very big difference. It looks like from the census data that um, people of color are, and Hispanics in particular, are not only not, they're not only using less, you know, less, that they are more recent users, probably in relation, and therefore less skilled at using search in particular, which means that in terms of access to media, and the example you gave of film versus theater is a great example of high-low, the you know, classic high-low media division, that um, partly because you say film is well-organized, kind of, you know, um, people with low skill in terms of the internet, and I don't see that as being, I see it as neutral, right? It's just a, an aspect of, yeah, of, yeah. of how accustomed they are to particular interfaces, right? But they're less likely to find content which is actually going to be different from what's offline. Mm -hmm. So what they're getting is a narrow, narrow, narrow internet. And people who have higher skill are getting a wide internet, mainly because they have the ability to find things more effectively 
not only find what they're supposed to find, but to find what they might right. not be supposed to find. Right. <laughs> to be able to get around roadblocks and help you out what you want. So it sounds like, and tell me if this is what you found, that people of color don't have <coughs> as high skills and that what they're getting is in fact a different internet and whether this is something that we ought to be concerned about because in a way the internet and you know Frank's work conference as a digital video is going to allow everybody to become an artist in some way. It's going to give everybody the ability to produce something that's high quality, good production value, and they can create their own wealth in both in terms of like media production in some way. And um, from what you're saying, is did you find that people of color in your study were significantly less skilled at search than others? Well, I'm sorry, this is the last question and I don't really have an answer because I actually only had three Hispanics and eight African Americans in my study, so I didn't feel like I could really I didn't feel that was large enough of a sample to really draw conclusions. So I, I can't really address this question. Um, in the statistical analyses, I controlled for one of those variables just as a control, but purposefully don't really discuss it. So I think we need more studies of this. Um, and again, the, this future project that I'm planning will have a much, more, much larger representation, partly because now I live in a much more diverse area that I will be able to sample. More, but uh, unfortunately, I can't address this. But I think what you're saying that makes a lot of sense, and I think you're right that um, basically some of the those people who are already, and it, it relates to what I said before, those people who are already disadvantaged to a certain extent, lower, possibly lower economic status, lower income, who come online later, are doubly disadvantaged in terms of how there might be the differences in skill because of this lag, time lag, and and also because there are more um, commercial influences now than there were five years ago. I think those are stronger. So I think there's actually more sort of, so to speak, to fight against almost. It's a good point, it's an interesting point. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. <laughs>